So my name is Elizabeth Disbro. I'm in the Department of Neurology at LSU Health Sciences Center Shreveport. I'm an associate professor. I'm also the director of the Center for Brain Health. First, I have no disclosures. Um, I have no conflict of interest. I don't own any companies or have any financial um, investment in any of the topics that we're going to talk about today and the views expressed are my own. So my goals today are to provide you with some knowledge about Alzheimer's disease and related dementias, um, the underlying pathology and some of the biomarkers. And you'll see this abbreviation ADRD throughout the talk. It's the, um, it's the term that's used by the National Institute of Health to describe Alzheimer's disease and other dementias that are difficult to distinguish while people are alive. So um, we've grouped them all together. Um, I also would like to let you know about some of the ongoing research that we have uh, locally. Um, it's uh, hopeful to talk to patients about how they can contribute and their caregivers how they can contribute um, to a solution instead of focusing on the problem. Um, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about community resources and um, for patients and for caregivers. So the way that I'm going to meet these objectives is to talk about first about disease mechanisms, then about um, diagnosis, and then um, some of the work that we've been doing in the community. So we have three theories, basic theories that we're going to talk about. Um, the first one is the amyloid hypothesis. You may uh, know about uh, plaques and tangles. Um, plaques and tangles are made up of misfolded proteins, and one of those misfolded proteins is beta amyloid. Um, the second uh, hypothesis is related to mitochondrial function. Mitochondria are the powerhouses of our cells, and they, uh, this, they start to uh, lose their efficiency, and they fail, and are part of a cycle of, cell, of nerve cell death that we're going to talk a little bit about. And then the third one is the vascular hypothesis. We're learning a lot more that um, the vascular system is making a big contribution to uh, how, we, how well we age cognitively. So <clears throat> here's a schematic of plaques and tangles. Like I said, uh, plaques are the extracellular clumps of, of misfolded protein that are made out of beta amyloid. And then um, the tangles are made out of a, pro a misfolded protein called tau and those are um, largely intracellular. And here is a picture of a post-mortem brain slice showing beta amyloid and tau in a, in a human brain. And this is the gold standard for identifying someone who has dementia with the obvious downside that um, it doesn't work very well in people who are living. So, <clears throat> um, the amyloid hypothesis is based on, as I said, misfolded beta amyloid. Um, beta amyloid normally is part of the structure of nerve cells and is important for nerve growth and communication. And this amyloid precursor protein is embedded in the membrane of the cell. And when you're young, um, beta amyloid does what it needs to do and it gets cleared out um, in large quantities and everything's fine and you don't even know it's happening and you never think about it. But as you get, people get older, um, it tends to clump up. So this aggregation of um, beta amyloid plaque formation disrupts cell to cell communication and it also um, leads to inflammation, which is damaging to nerve cells. So tau is a microtubule stabilizing protein. It forms this foot that helps the nerve cells maintain their stabilization and their structure, and it starts to disintegrate in Alzheimer's disease, and the pieces form tangles. So the next hypothesis that we're going to talk about um, is called the mitochondria association membrane hypothesis. The mitochondria, as I said before, are um, the powerhouses to all of our cells, including neurons. And here in a healthy cell, um, you can see along the bottom, there's a cell membrane for our neuron, and there's a calcium channel, this orange uh, calcium channel. 
Um, a big part of the way that neurons work is that a, an electrical gradient is created between the inside and the outside of the cell. The inside of the cell is negative, the outside of the cell is positive, and the way that neurons communicate is that polarization is changed when something like a calcium ion, which is positive, moves inside the cell. So um, the important point there is that this gradient needs to be maintained for healthy cell communication and function. So uh, the system is fairly elaborate. Um, and you can see here um, another important point is that the mitochondrion in green, um, that's our actual energy producer. Um, you can see the line going through that says ADP to ATP. That's adenosine triphosphate at the top, the ATP. That is our common currency for energy across our cells. So all of our food, whether we eat a pizza or a salad, uh, gets converted into uh, ATP, and that's how our cells uh, receive and use energy. Um, so in a healthy cell, we're making lots of, of ATP, and a bunch of that ATP is being used um, to manage our calcium gradient. So you can see some of it is inside the mitochondrion, and then on the right in the ER, which is endoplasmic reticulum, we have sequestration of calcium as well. So the cell works really hard to keep calcium on the inside to a minimum, keeps most of the calcium on the outside. In an unhealthy cell, uh, we see that we've got some beta amyloid in the cell membrane, as well as our extracellular plaques. Uh, that is interfering with the calcium channel and making it less effective. Uh, you can see the ER endoplasmic reticulum, all the calcium's leaking out because we've got beta amyloid interfering there. And then in our mitochondrion, we've got beta amyloid interfering there. Um, the calcium balance is disrupted, and you can see this sad red X through the ATP. Um, so it eventually stops making energy and the cell dies. So, this sustained calcium um, dyshomeostasis is a precursor for neuronal dysfunction, including synapse loss. That's the gap between the two neurons that um, is important for communication. Um, we get dendritic pruning, um, which are the arms of the neuron that are also key for communication. We get lack of network connectivity and apoptosis, which is cell death. Okay, so the third hypothesis that we're going to talk about is the vascular hypothesis. Um, imbalance, so the, the basic idea is an imbalance between blood flow-based substrate delivery. So we know that our circulatory system brings oxygen and things that the cells need, and there's a mismatch between what the cells need and um, what they are receiving from the, from the vascular system. And the contributors to this mismatch are uh, hypertension, cerebrovascular disease, um, sedentary lifestyle. Sedentary lifestyle is also a big deal for mitochondrial function. So if you exercise, you're going to get decreased um, vascular risk factors. But also um, mitochondria are a big part of m muscle. When we put it, when we build more muscle through exercise, we build a lot more mitochondria, and that increase in mitochondria not only helps our muscles, but it helps our brain. So we know for sure that exercise is key, uh, both for the mitochondrial aspects and for the vascular aspects of Alzheimer's disease. Um, so just a couple of facts uh, from human studies. Vascular disease is a key mechanism in triggering the manifestations of Alzheimer's disease. Uh, longitudinal data indicates that people with a history of high blood pressure or cholesterol are twice as likely to get dementia, and if they have both, they're four times as likely. Um, and there is some anecdotal evidence that antihypertensive medications can help protect against dementia as well, although that I haven't seen a lot of super strong evidence for that. And then I'm putting this picture in here of the uh, uh, this is a fluorescent stain of a blood vessel that you can see in red, and then around it are clumps of beta amyloid. So high 
cholesterol and high blood pressure lead to increased levels of beta amyloid, a source of beta amyloid is the vascular system. The vascular, in that inner lining of the vessel produces beta amyloid and um, vascular disease increases production. So we know now um, from what we've talked about so far that that's probably pretty bad. So a research project that we're doing at um, LSU Health Sciences Center in Shreveport is on a marker of vascular dysfunction called hydrogen sulfide. Uh, we're partnering with our colleagues at the um, Center for Cardiovascular Diseases and Sciences. Uh, they've been looking at hydrogen sulfide as a marker of cardiovascular disease. So in the nervous system, hydrogen sulfide is a signaling molecule um, that's involved in the physiological processes of neurons. And while we're learning more and more about the metabolism of this molecule, we don't know how it, what role it plays in dementia. But it seems like a good target. It seemed to us like a good target to look at given how important the cardiovascular system is in Alzheimer's disease. We enrolled a lot of people. We screened them with a cognitive test called the Alzheimer's Disease Assessment Scale. Uh, we took some MRI images of them, including um, the most interesting one for our purposes is the FLARE. It's a fluid attenuated inversion recovery image that gives us a measure of microvascular disease in the brain. And then we looked at, at differences among people with dementia and people without. Um, this is a violin plot, uh, if you haven't seen one before. But what you can see from, the, um, from this table of this graph is that total hydrogen sulfide was different between control and um, Alzheimer's disease participants, the uh, levels were significantly increased in Alzheimer's disease. Furthermore, we correlated our hydrogen sulfide levels with the cognitive um, outcome scores that we got for people and we saw a very strong correlation. So the dark circles are the controls and the open circles are our Alzheimer's disease folks. And you can see that um, it looks to me like if you're healthy, your cognitive function and your hydrogen sulfide are in a pretty tight ball down there on the left. Um, but once you start to have trouble, uh, your, your hydrogen sulfide's levels start drifting up. And we saw a similar relationship between uh, lesion volume, so that's that microvascular disease measure that I was telling you about, um, and total hydrogen sulfide. Not as strong, but quite strong. So we did a receiver operator curve analysis, uh, which tells us how well we were able to discriminate uh, people with and without dementia based on our hydrogen sulfide. Um, and our ability to discri discriminate was really quite high. Um, we judge this by the area under the curve. So you can see that line that's going straight up the middle of the graph, that's 50%. So uh, if we flipped a coin, um, our results would fall along that line, but we were at uh, 0.94 um, for our area under the curve, which means it was almost perfect being able to tell the difference between who had Alzheimer's disease and who did not. Uh, we also did um, a, an analysis to see what were the most important uh, variables that we had in this discrimination between Alzheimer's disease and not Alzheimer's disease because we had measures of um, we had, uh, various MRI measures. We also had different types of hydrogen sulfide. Um, and you can see that this analysis showed us on the left that hydrogen sulfide, total hydrogen sulfide by itself was enough to discriminate um, to, uh, about 92 to 93 percent of the people. And we actually have a cutoff of 1.64 millimolar. And once you get above that, that's when you start to have cognitive deficits. And our sensitivity, which means how well were we able to detect people who actually had the disease was 0.8, and our specificity, meaning how well were we able to leave out people that did not have the disease was um, almost 98%, so quite good for a single marker. Um, and we're not the only people that are having success with their uh, vascular, uh, with research on the vascular component of the disease. In this graph, it's showing you over time 
um, that there are several biomarkers that are important. So obviously beta amyloid and tau, but also um, this new red, this red line has been a new um, piece of this graph that's just been added recently um, to show that, it, that th we think that the vascular abnormalities happen first before we start seeing uh, beta amyloid and tau problems. Okay, so I'm going to talk about just a couple more. Um, I get a lot of questions about what's the role of diabetes in Alzheimer's disease. It turns out it's a big one. Um, and in fact, researchers have coined the term type 3 diabetes to talk about when nerve cells become insulin resistant. Insulin resistant um, results in uh, abnormal exchange of uh, insulin in the brain, oxidative stress, so some more toxic, uh, some more of that toxic reactions that we saw with the mitochondrial hypothesis, um, and it slows down the, the um, elimination of beta amyloid in the brain and in the pancreas. And we also know that there are a lot of insulin receptors in the learning and memory areas of the brain, so the hippocampus and the frontal cortex. Um, and one more point, the accumulation of proteins such as beta amyloid interfere with, insul with insulin mediation um, and nerve growth, synapse formation, and neurotransmitter production. So what I usually say at this point is, put down the soda, drink something different. <laughs> so another question that I get asked a lot is, um, do genetics play a role in Alzheimer's disease? Uh, we do know that the apolipoprotein gene um, carries cholesterol and other types of fat in the blood, and that there are several different forms of mutations, actually at least four of them, because APOE4 mutation is the major known risk factor um, for regular, what we think of as late onset Alzheimer's disease. However, 25% of the people um, walking around have the APOE4 mutation, and only 40 to 65% of people with Alzheimer's disease have the mutation. So many people have the mutation don't get the disease, and pe some people that do have the disease don't have the mutation. The same is true, um, and I think we're going to talk about that next, the same is true with a bunch of these issues that we've been talking about. Um, so APOE4 results in uh, lipid dysregulation, so trouble with that cell membrane that we were looking at, deficient beta amyloid clearance, uh, pro-inflammatory response, so you get more inflammation, um, and deficient glucose metabolism. So again, you can see how all of these things are crossing over and um, they all interact with each other, all these factors. So this slide is a picture that I took straight out of the Atlantic and I've cited them at the bottom um, so that it's clear where this came from, but it's such a great depiction of, of a, culmin a summary of what we've been talking about. So this um, article was paid for by the Alzheimer's Association, and it was about how the era of personalized um, medication and intervention is upon us. So the era of one-size-fits-all Alzheimer's treatments is nearing an end. As with many other diseases, scientists expect multi-pronged Alzheimer's treatments will soon be tailor-made for individuals based on their unique genetic biomarker. And lifestyle characteristics. So that really fits with what we've been talking about. We've got these different hypotheses. We know um, beta amyloid, mitochondrial dysfunction, vascular dysfunction, genetics, and lifestyle, and diabetes all feed into it. And different people are going to have different combinations and have more trouble with one of these than another. And so in order to prevent and treat dementia, we need to target the specific needs of the person. And so, for example, I was reading an article yesterday that said that um, on autopsy, they found that Caucasian folks had 
were more likely to have a single problem and that African Americans were more likely to have multiple problems, um, even though they looked the same in terms of their deficits when they were alive. Now that we've gone through all the biology, you can see that diagnosis is not simple. There are multiple factors, and how do we take all that into account and come up with an accurate diagnosis, especially when we can't look for the plaques and tangles until um, post-mortem? There are several different approaches to diagnosis, behavioral, brain imaging, and blood biomarker. Um, so the Diagnostic, Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders is the book that psychiatrists use. It gives criteria for diagnosing schizophrenia and other mental disorders, but it also has a section on dementia. It states that um, we can diagnose someone with Alzheimer's disease if their issues were gradually, the onset was gradual. Um, you need to rule out other issues like cardiovascular disease, substance, um, like medication interference or other neurological conditions. And they come up with two categories, major neurocognitive disorder and a minor neurocognitive disorder. Um, they really prefer that you have the genetic mutation in order to make this diagnosis, which isn't really realistic. Um, we're looking at a decline in memory in one, in, and one other cognitive domain is the main difference between the major and, and minor um, categories, and um, they want you to rule out mixed etiology. The hardest part is that um, we need to be able to assess that there are pro there's a progressive decline without any plateaus, but what that requires is that you monitor the person over a long period of time, and usually um, our loved ones are seeing their primary care doctor for maybe 10 minutes. And so there's this, this is a very, um, it's not, it's not a very practical way to do it. Um, there's the ADOS COG, this Alzheimer's disease and assessment scale. That's what we use for research purposes. Basically we give people a whole laundry list of tests that have to do with different types of memory and executive function. Um, this test is pretty good. It has a sensitivity and specificity of 90 and 86, uh, respectively, uh, which means that it can detect people who do have the disease and it doesn't say that people have the disease when they don't have it. The problem here is uh, that you need to have um, training in how to administer it. Um, it's vulnerable to variability in patient performance. We all know that some days people with Alzheimer's are doing pretty well and some days they're not. And depending on what kind of a day you get them on, it can be a pretty wide variation. Um, and it's also time consuming. Somebody who has a lot of trouble with memory, it can take several hours. So that's also not terribly practical. Um, MRI gives us a clue. Uh, one of the main characteristics of dementia is that we get uh, hippocampal uh, atrophy and enlarged ventricles. So here's an example of a brain atrophy along the top. We have three views of a healthy brain and along the bottom you can see there's some differences in the brain of someone who has dementia. The ventricles or those dark areas are much larger and um, here you can see that the hippocampus uh, has atrophied as well. We can also um, image beta amyloid using positron emission tomography, uh, using radi radioactive tracers. Um, this technique has a low false negative rate, but a high false positive rate. So we get everyone who has dementia, but there are actually a fair number of people in the world walking around with a pretty significant beta amyloid load who do not have dementia. So longitudinal data showed that we could correctly classify about 89% of participants who progress to Alzheimer's disease, um, and, but only 58% of participants who did not. Folks are working on PET for the tau protein. Um, we have uh, sort of the opposite where the um, sensitivity was 38%, but the specific specificity was 95%. So we left behind a lot of people who actually did have dementia, but everybody that was labeled um, positive was in fact positive for Alzheimer's disease. 
Um, and we can, we're also able to measure beta amyloid um, and in blood and CSF. Um, in the blood, it's a pretty good marker with 91% um, specificity and 71% uh, sensitivity. Uh, it's better in cerebral spinal fluid. However, that requires a spinal tap, which is pretty invasive. Um, and some forms of tau have also been used to discriminate Alzheimer's disease from um, non-Alzheimer's disease, but as you can see, this work is, was in the Journal of the American Medical Association in 2020, so this is brand new. And then we can compare that to our blood tests where we looked at hydrogen sulfide, which had an area under the curve of 0.94, a sensitivity of 0.89, and a specificity of 0.98. Our last section is on the dementia and community resources. In our community, um, we have about 4,000 people who are between the ages of 65 and 74. 15% um, of those folks have dementia, but if you're over 75, the number jumps to about 40%, and that's another 5,500 people. So we have about 10,000 people in our community within a 75 mile radius of where we're sitting now who have dementia. Um, so we wanted to learn more about how these folks are interacting with the resources in the community um, because there are so many. So uh, nationwide, there are about 55 million Americans who have Alzheimer's disease, but by 2050, there, that should almost triple. Um, We've also got 40 million caregivers that provide 37 billion hours of care for adults um, with limitations like dementia, which uh, has an estimated value of $470 billion. Caregivers spend a weekly average of 30 hours providing care. So you can imagine if you have a job um, or kids, that that gets to be a pretty big deal. Um, so our goal in this next study that we're going to talk about was to assess barriers and facilitators to the use of community resources to, to try to provide some, um, to see how caregivers are using these resources to provide uh, relief from this grueling schedule. Um, so along the bottom here is the reference to our recently um, published paper. This project was done in collaboration with Connie Arnold and Terry Davis, who are both uh, sociologists in the Department of Internal Medicine at the Med Center. Um, we went to churches and alumni uh, sororities and Council on Aging sites, and we went to the uh, health fair. at the, There's a geriatric health fair at the state fair. We went there. We handed, we, we, so we talked to um, tons of people. First we did focus groups. We identified some areas that everybody was talking about. Um, people had a lot of questions about Alzheimer's disease, sort of like the material that we've already covered today. They wanted to know about diagnosis and medical care. Um, healthcare literacy was a major barrier. They wanted to know more about caregiver support and they wanted to know more about how they could participate in research. So we made up a questionnaire. Um, here's an example of it. We tried to use good literacy. Um, we stuck to the literacy guidelines where we use lots of white space. Um, we tried to make our questions as simple as possible. So you can see on the, the top is a good example where you get support. Check all that apply. Just a list. This bottom one is probably one of our most complicated questions. Um, have you been to a support group for Alzheimer's disease? We could have saved a lot of space on this one because the answer is no. <laughs> for the most part, but we tried to ca characterize it as best we could. Um, so our participants were mostly about 50% African American. We were really targeting that population. So in order to assess the economic situation of our participants, we asked them to tell us about how much money they had at the end of the month, whether they had money left over, um, whether they had just enough to make ends meet or if they did not have enough to make ends meet. And you can see uh, that most of our folks fell into the first two categories. So um, economic, they, they were in pretty good shape economically. 
Um, and then to assess literacy, we asked them how comfortable they were filling out medical forms, which of course everyone's going to say, I'd rather not do that. But um, most people, as you can see, were pretty confident in how well they could fill the forms out. And so we took that to be that healthcare literacy was pretty high. <clears throat> so we found that only 21% of our respondents had uh, taken their loved one to see a medical specialist or been able to get access to a medical specialist. 54% um, of the participants got medical information from their doctor, which is pretty good. Um, only 37% used the internet as a resource to learn more about the disease or the community resources. 28% um, had been to a support group, but most of them did not uh, rate it as being very helpful. And only 8% used adult uh, respite services. Um, and then we asked them about uh, difficulties in caring for their loved one, um, anything from cost and distance, transportation, unsure about the loved one's needs. Um, you can see from this graph uh, that on the right, in the gray, we have 20% of the um, African American participants said that they had trouble with family agreement on what to do. And then on the Caucasian sample, 0% um, had a disagreement about what to do. Um, which I thought was probably explained by this graph, which is the living accommodations for the loved one with um, dementia. Uh, you can see that most people on the left are trying to keep the person in their own home, um, but that the uh, African-American caregivers were much more likely to take the person into their own home um, in the light purple there on that second category. Uh, but if you look on the right, folks that were in nursing homes or dementia-specific care facilities, um, the Caucasian caregivers were more frequently taking that option than the African-American ones. And so um, if you are putting grandma in a home, there's very little disagreement about what to do. And this is important um, because the folks that are dealing with a, care, with a loved one in their home are going to need a lot different services they're not going to be able to go to a support group. Um, they're going to have less time to research options. And um, if they're giving 30 hours of care, they're not really going to, they're basically going to be putting out fires and have very different needs than the folks um, who are dealing with their loved ones in a nursing home. So the conclusions um, are that awareness and use of community services was minimal. Um, existing programs may not fit the needs of all groups. Um, and that our current, we need to rethink our currently available resources. And the last thing that I'm going to show you is um, give you some resources. So what if you see a patient who has Alzheimer's disease? Is there anything that, that we can do to help you? Um, we always have studies ongoing on uh, Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease. We're doing that. Um, we're doing that study on the um, blood biomarker. We have another one where we're hopefully getting started soon where we're going to be offering care navigators, so additional support for uh, caregivers. And you can give your patients or you can call us. This number that's up here is my lab and this um, strange email address that was designed originally for our Parkinson's study but works for all of our studies. You can send us an email. And that um, actually gets forwarded to my personal email account, so I will respond to you. So please um, contact us with any kind of questions that you have. Um, give the information to your patients. Um, this is a symposium. This Alzheimer's um, Hopeful Symposium is for caregivers. It just happened this year, but it's an annual event. And it's a great way to get a lot of information in a very short time if you're a caregiver or if you work with caregivers. Um, and we, as the Center for Brain Health, always publicize this event. And so um, if, you're if you're interested, you can join the Center for Brain Health and you will automatically get that email to remind you to go. Um, joining the Center for Brain Health involves sending me an email that you want to join the Center for Brain Health. Um, and then in the community, we have the Alzheimer's and Dementia Resource Center, um, also known as the Bridge. And Stacy, my colleague Stacy Hand, is going to talk some more about that. Um, 
and the Caddo Council on Aging. Every parish in Louisiana has a Caddo, has a, not a Caddo, but has a Council on Aging, and they provide respite care, Meals on Wheels, and so on. So there's something for everyone in the state of Louisiana. So thank you for your attention. Um, this work was funded by the NIH and by the um, LSU uh, Grant and Aid Program.